Good evening. Welcome to our Good Friday service tonight. And trusting that what we do here this evening not only will minister to your heart, but better prepare you for what we have in store for Sunday morning. You know, the Christian life is one of emotion. God talks about his love for us, and we can only love because he first loved us. And so we oftentimes think about the joy there is in fellowship, the celebration that there is in being in a relationship with our God. But sometimes we need to think through what causes for that love to be real. What is the, the purpose or the, the motivation even for that joy that we feel? And it's because of what took place on Calvary's Mountain on a Friday night so many years ago. And so tonight is by intent, uh, by design, a little bit quieter of a service. We're going to give you time, both here in the room and online tonight, to just spend a moment of quiet, to reflect upon what Christ has done for each and every one of us. And so we're glad that you have chosen to be with us tonight to celebrate what Jesus did for each and every one of us on, on Calvary's cross. And so welcome, thank you for being here, but before we go any further, would you bow with me and let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for the way that you love us and for the joy that there is in being known and being loved by you. And so oftentimes we think of the joy there is in being a Christian, and that is certainly true. But it's because of the great sorrow that was rendered and it was poured out that we can have the joy and the sense of love. And so tonight on this Friday evening, we have gathered to remember what took place on Calvary's cross some 2,000 years ago now. And so as we contemplate the death of Jesus, as we think about his substitutionary death for each and every one of us and his great sacrifice, we pray that our hearts would be moved, moved to a place of greater love, of greater joy, but the pathway to that tonight may be through grappling with sorrow, with a sadness, with a heaviness. And so Lord, I pray that you would find within our hearts tonight people who are very real and understanding the great price that has been paid for us and the joy and the love that is ours because of what took place on Calvary's cross some 2,000 years ago. So thank you for this evening. We thank you mostly for Jesus, for his love, for his life. And tonight we think on his death. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. I have been saved 
child, the term Good Friday confused me. It perplexed me. I didn't understand it. And I knew that that was the day that Jesus had died. I had been taught that he was a good man, a good teacher. He was kind. He was loving. And then he was killed. And I remember that he was killed on that Good Friday. And I remember going to my mom and asking her, why is it called Good Friday? And she simply stated, well, that's the day that Jesus died. Now, I don't know if she thought that's all the answer that a young boy needed. Maybe I caught her, as kids often do, when she had 19 other things to do, and that was the answer that she could give, and, and we left it at that. But I remember vividly being even greater confused and perplexed because of my mom's answer. My mom was a, a good woman. She was a kind woman. And I couldn't understand why she thought Jesus dying was good. That just baffled me. It confused me. And I thought, my mom wasn't complicit in his death, but could she have been like the people in the crowd that day yelling, crucify? I, I just didn't know what to think. But she said that it was a good Friday because Jesus died. And then I had to think on that. That's a true story. Now, probably close to 60 years later, I still remember that conversation with my mom. I could take you to the place in our home where that conversation took place because it was profound for me. And so even now, as I mentioned 60 years later, there are still times when I think this term Good Friday maybe doesn't resonate with our community with people that think through what's taken place. And tonight, what I want to do is share with you some reasons why this is good, Friday. When my mom said it's because it's the day Jesus died, again, she left it at that. But you see, what took place because of his death was good. And because of that, we have hope, we have life, and there are things about us that could not be true if it weren't for his death. So tonight I want to share with you four things about Good Friday and, and what, what causes that day to be good. But first I'd like to read Mark's account for us. I'll be reading in Mark chapter 15, beginning at verse 16, where it says, Then the soldiers led him away to a hall called the Praetorium, and they called together the entire garrison. And they clothed Jesus in purple, and they twisted a crown of thorns, and they put it upon his head. And they began to salute him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And then they struck him on the head with a reed. They spat on him. They bowed their knee in a mocking form of worship. And as they mocked him, they took the purple off of him. And then they put his own clothes on him again. And they began to cry out, let's lead him to be crucified. 
Then they compelled a man by the name of Simon, a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country, a passerby, to bear the cross of Jesus. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which translated means the place of the skull. And then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but Jesus did not take it. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what each man would take. Now it was the third hour when they crucified him, and the inscription above his head upon the cross was written, Here is Jesus, the King of the Jews. With him they also crucified two robbers, one on his right, one on his left. So the scripture would be fulfilled, which says, He was numbered together with the transgressors. And those who passed by also blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you destroy the temple in three days, but you cannot save yourself. Save yourself, come down from that cross. And likewise, the chief priests also mocking, speaking to themselves and the scribes, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. Even those who were crucified then began to revile him. Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land. And in the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice crying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which translated means, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of those who stood by, when they heard that, said, He's calling out for Elijah. Then someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it up to him to drink. And they said, Let him alone. Let's see if Elijah will come and offer him to drink. As Jesus cried out with a loud voice, he then breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top. The bottom. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw and heard what he had seen that day, he said, Surely this man is the Son of God. As I mentioned, I want to share four reasons why we call this Good Friday. You see, at the cross, Jesus took our curse upon himself. I don't know if you've ever thought about a curse, but Scripture says that we are all cursed. You see, just as there are laws in a city, a state, a, a country, God has laws as well. And they are established for all mankind. If we break a civil law, there are fines, there are penalties, there could even be incarceration. But if we break a law from God, there is also a penalty that must be paid. On more than 20 occasions in Scripture, it says that breaking God's law causes for there to be a curse placed upon us. The penalty of sin is ours. When we transgress, when we go against God's way, we, we sin, we transgress, we are cursed, Scripture says. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, in Job chapter 5, Isaiah chapter 59, each of these authors tell us that one way to determine or detect when there is curse, there is a darkness that comes over the land. And each one of these Old Testament writers talk about darkness at midday as a sign of a curse upon the people. In Mark chapter 15, 33, it tells us that while Jesus was on the cross, there was a darkness, I just read this for us, from noon until three that afternoon. You see, there was a curse that was being fought against. There was a curse that was being battled. It was not the curse of Jesus. It was the curse that was due and rightfully all of mankind's. And at his death, when Jesus breathes his last, when he cries out, it is finished, Mark also tells us that day came forth and broke forth. For you see, the penalty of the curse had been broken. And so you see tonight, for those of us that trust in Jesus, there is no longer any curse. And for that, we can be grateful. We can see that this is a good Friday. 
not only the curse, but there was a payment that was rendered that day as well. At the cross, Jesus took your place, he took my place in death. Again, the gospel writer Mark helps us to see earlier in his gospel, he read about the time when Jesus came before Pilate in one of these mockery of trials that Jesus went through on that last day of his life. And Jesus stands before Pilate, and there is a rendering upon Jesus by Pilate himself, where he says, I I find no fault in this man, he is innocent. The problem was, the crowd had come expecting a crucifixion that day. The crowd was bloodthirsty. The crowd wanted the show. And they knew that Barabbas and others were scheduled to be crucified that day. And, and then Pilate saying, according to your own laws and customs, I can, I can set one man free today. Many believe that Pilate assumed that Jesus would be the one that the crowd cried out for. Just four days earlier, they had welcomed him into Jerusalem, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the king. And so some, some four days later, Pilate offers Shall I set free Barabbas or Jesus? The crowd cries, give us Barabbas. And Pilate asks, what then shall I do with Jesus? Crucify. 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 And Mark gives us an understanding of Jesus' sacrificial death, that Barabbas was a guilty sinner. Scripture says he was a, a murderer. He was deserving of death. Jesus was an innocent man, yet he stands condemned. And the crowd gathered that day again. They were bloodthirsty. They were looking for the show. They were expecting to witness an execution of Barabbas and two others. And and not knowing that there had been a secret in these clandestine trials that, that night and early morning, Jesus now stood before an angry mob. They wanted to see death. They wanted to see blood spilled. And now in setting Barabbas free, Jesus is a substitutionary death. In some ways, he's a substitute for Barabbas. He certainly is for the crowd. But more so, he's a a substitute for me. He's a substitute for you. His life is offered up as a substitutionary death for each and every one of us. Just as Barabbas was guilty, we too are guilty and deserving of God's full penalty. In Romans chapter 3, verse 10, it says, There is no one righteous, no, not one. So there's not one of us who can stand in our own righteousness, that can present ourselves before God, and, and in ourselves be accepted of Him. And so there was the need for my sin to be paid for, a price that I could never hope to pay, And Christ willingly paid that for me and for you. And so in Romans it says, God shows his great love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's true that none of us in ourselves are righteous individuals. Isaiah says, our righteousness is but a filthy rag. And so at the cross, Jesus, thirdly, what he does for us is he clothes us now in his righteousness. As I read for you earlier, he was stripped before the crucifixion. This was Rome's way of humiliating a condemned man, just trying to make even his death more embarrassing, more humiliating. And so as a matter of fact, earlier in the day, the Roman executioners had gambled away for Jesus' clothing. And Jesus now is laid bare, and he is clothed, not with clothes made by hand, but in his own righteousness. Isaiah chapter 61 says, I will rejoice in the Lord, my soul will exalt in my God, for he has clothed me in the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of his righteousness. And so because of what Jesus does on Calvary's cross, you and I today are clothed In salvation, we are clothed in his righteousness. Job says in chapter 29, I put on righteousness, for you see, it has clothed me. My justice is like a robe 
before the Almighty God. You see, the curse has been lifted. The penalty of death has been paid. And now I am clothed, as are you, in his righteousness. And what does it mean to be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus? It means now that we are acceptable. We are welcome into God's very presence. Apart from that, we are cast out. And so you see, at the cross, we have been clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And so fourthly, at the cross, Jesus gives us access, access to the Father, access ultimately to heaven. When Jesus died, it says that the curtain there at the Holy of Holies was, was torn in two. But did you note when I read that it said it was torn from the top to the bottom? If a man had come into the Holy of Holies to tear the curtain, he would have grabbed the bottom of the hem and torn up. What does it mean that the, the, the curtain was torn from top to bottom? It was God himself who rendered the curtain in two, saying that there is no longer a barrier between man and God. You see, Jesus, through his death on Calvary's cross, made it so that we have access to the Father, we're acceptable to Him, and we are no longer these outcasts. We're no longer kept outside. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 22. He says, Therefore, brothers, since we have this confidence now to enter into the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened up through us through the tearing of the curtain. You see, it really was the rendering of his flesh. And since that, we have a great high priest who is over the household of God. And let us draw now near to him with a true heart, full of assurance and faith. Many things took place on that Good Friday. I, I've shared with you just four. But I pray that tonight, as we think on that death of Jesus, we can think that the curse that is rightfully ascribed to me is, has been lifted. The penalty of death that is mine for having transgressed his laws has been paid. And that because of coming into a relationship with Christ, today we stand clothed in righteousness, not of our own making, but of his. And because of that righteousness, tonight we have access to God the Father, we are deemed acceptable and welcome into his very presence. I asked my mom 60 years ago, why is it called Good Friday? She simply said, well, that's the day that Jesus died. As a young child, I did not understand. And tonight I stand before you to tell you it's probably the most meaningful thing in my life. That if it weren't for that Good Friday, I would not be a man of hope. I would not be a man of faith. And because of that Good Friday, tonight we can celebrate some obscure Jewish carpenter who willingly laid his life upon the cross for each one of us so that our curse would be forgiven, the penalty of death would be paid, and tonight we are in his righteousness welcome before him. I'm going to do something that we don't often do, probably not enough. As I mentioned a few moments ago, I just want to spend a few moments of quiet. In this busy and hectic world, I think quiet moments are too few and too far between. And so what we'd like to do is just give you a few moments to contemplate the cross of Jesus. Think about why this is a good Friday in your mind and in your heart. And then after just a few moments, I'll gather us back together with a closing prayer. But let's bow and just be quiet before him.
Psalm 46.10 tells us to be still and contemplate the fact that you are God. And Father, I admit that in my life, in my world, I don't do that often enough. There are not times when I am quiet before you enough to really satisfy my soul. And so I thank you for the wisdom, the admonition to do so. And while tonight was very short, I pray that maybe those of us in this room, those watching tonight might have sensed the, the beauty of that quietness, the intimacy that we can share with you and allow you to speak. And I pray that because of that, maybe there will be many, many more quiet moments for us in the days and weeks, months, years ahead. But tonight we have gathered in this place to remember Jesus, to remember that he willingly, as Peter tells us, laid down his life, a life that no man could take from him, but he willingly yielded that so that there might be an atonement for sin. And while it was 2,000 years ago, my sin put Jesus upon the cross. And while it was 2,000 years ago, every person who has ever lived has had their sin laid upon the very burden of Jesus. And so we thank you that our sin is paid for. And that because of that, there today is no longer a curse. There's no longer a penalty of death. And tonight we can stand in righteousness. Again, not of our own making, but the righteousness of Jesus imparted, imputed really to us. And so we thank you that tonight we can celebrate who he is in our life, what he has done for each and every one of us, and that because of that, we tonight have access to the Father. And not just for tonight, but really for all eternity. We live in the kingdom now. We don't wait for heaven to be in your presence. We are there at this moment. And so we celebrate being your child. We celebrate the ability to come into your presence now and to enjoy fellowship and to be loved by you. We thank you for this Friday when we can remember Jesus. We look forward to Sunday because we know what has taken place. And as we gather on Sunday to celebrate the risen Christ, I pray that because of what we have done here tonight, contemplating the death of Jesus, will make his resurrection, his life, even more meaningful, more dear for each and every one of us. So thank you for this evening. I thank you for those here, for those watching, those who will watch in the days ahead, that we would contemplate to think on Jesus, the great love that he has for us to welcome us into his kingdom, into his presence. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. There's no way.
is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. I sing a new song to Him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. I sing a new song to Him who sits on Father, we thank you so much for your great love. We thank you so much that you had a plan to reconcile us to you so that we not, would not be under the curse. Thank you, Father, for your son, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, for your willingness to pay the price for our sin so we could be engrafted into your family. Help us to never forget the great price that was paid on the cross at Calvary Hill. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.